Uh, okay, I'm going to hear, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, our keynote speaker, Dr. Mark McClellan, and I'm sure everybody in the, in the room know who he is. Uh, it's all good. Uh, so what I'm going to do is going to have start with a brief introduction. So Dr. McClellan is now the director of the uh, Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform at the Brookings Institute. He started the position since 2007. Uh, he got his degree from UT Austin, and then after that, he went on to Harvard uh, and get uh, an MPA degree. And then, then he received his PhD from Harvard MIT Division of Health Science and Technology in 1992, and then received his PhD in, in economics from MIT in 1993. Um, Dr. McCollin's uh, first faculty position is at Stanford University. So after he received his uh, tenure of associate professor, he moved on to government services. He served. Um, as the commissioner of the FDA from 2002 to 2004. Then he became the uh, administrator for CMS from 2004 to 2006. Uh, his research focused on a wide uh, array of health economics issues related to healthcare, including the effectiveness of medical treatments in improving healthcare, economic and policy factors affecting medical treatment decision and health outcomes impact of new technology on public health and medical expenditures, and the relationship between health status and economic well-being. Um, so with that introduction, I'd like to welcome Dr. McClellan. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Tina, for that introduction. I've had the privilege of working with Tina over the years, and it's nice to see her uh, moving so much more intensely into cancer care and the economics of cancer. And it's also a real privilege, privilege to be with you all at this meeting, as I'll talk about. Um, while I have uh, had the opportunity to spend a lot of my career working on issues other than oncology, um, I do think that the issues that you're grappling with for this uh, workshop and oncology more generally has the potential to be a model for effective health care reform in this country. And by effective reform, I don't just mean expanding coverage, trying to find ways to get the prices down, but real reform in the way that care is delivered to uh, move us faster into an era of truly personalized and prevention-oriented medicine. Uh, the biomedical science in oncology uh, and cancer care is, I think, leading the way uh, in some of these efforts. And while there are a lot of challenges ahead, to the extent that we can work them out for cancer, it not only means uh, those, uh, all those uh, obstacles to, to getting the best care, uh, getting affordable, innovative care uh, to each patient uh, can make a big difference in uh, the treatment of cancer patients. It's actually a good model for where reform, I think, needs to head more generally in our healthcare system. So uh, I'm just going to try to give you some, some thoughts to help uh, stimulate the discussions that you all have uh, at this meeting and no doubt have in your work. Uh, in the months and years ahead to, to try to get to the goal of the, the meeting today of affordable, uh, and I would add innovative uh, care, personalized care for cancer patients. So I'm going to try to quickly go through a few topics and what I see as the fundamentals for uh, reforming health care and uh, how they apply to oncology, some specific opportunities in the area of oncology, which you all are looking at the agenda are uh, hearing a lot more about and talking a lot more about than I'm going to be able to go into here. Uh, so I want to get quickly to some issues around financing reform and, if there's time, uh, regulatory reforms and reforms in the, the process of uh, uh, developing cancer treatments that are happening. Um, I think you all have seen charts like this as one of the fundamentals uh, driving health care reform. Uh, this is a chart with the federal budget outlook. I do have a pointer here. Um, uh, this is the, the spending side of the nation's fiscal crisis, uh, divides spending into three categories, health care, that's the red, uh, that's growing rapidly uh, from here on out. Here's where we are. It's a fiscal cliff, right? Um, uh, that, that's uh, uh, so serious. It's really, it is a cliff, right? Uh, uh, that's uh, so security spending. It's going to go up by about a percent or so of GDP over the next 20 years with retirement of the baby boom and shifting demographics. Uh, that's a problem, but one I hope we can manage. And this is everything else that the federal government spends uh, money on. You can see under current law, all this is continued to project projected to go down. See where we started out 20 years ago, and there's almost like a steady stream out there. Um, and unlike the last uh, 30 years where uh, the nation's um, spending on the federal side, not counting interest payments on the debt, has been relatively constant, around 19% of GDP, that's projected to go way up. We had a big bump up with the stimulus spending and additional uh, you know, help uh, to uh, states and individuals who are uninsured with the Great Recession. On the uh, fiscal, on the uh, revenue side of this, 
uh, the reduction in the tax rates that occurred here has led to that uh, uh, big uh, uh, increase in the federal deficit, which now is running about 5% or 6% of GDP. Um, assuming that we, if, if we are going to get on track to resolve that, uh, we need to do, to do more than we have uh, already, and it has to involve health care. Built into these numbers, by the way, are all of those things that many of you who are in medical practice are concerned about in terms of Medicare reimbursement rates, so the, those rates are going to be squeezed down going forward under the ACA, physician payment, uh, the 30% the reduction, the SGR, non-fix, uh, 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 the, the, or like lack of a long-term fix, all that's built in here, so we kind of played out the, uh, the, the efforts to really squeeze down prices there. You can do the same chart, I'm not going to bother because I uh, just want to move along. I uh, could do the same start for state spending, where Medicaid is growing, everything else is shrinking, everything else, education, spending on low-income infrastructure, and everything else is shrinking, and that's projected to get worse. And for employers, um, most of the increases in wages that have occurred in the past decade have gone into paying for higher health care costs there, too. So this is, uh, uh, this is the big deal on the spending side. Um, I guess would uh, uh, add to this the way that, um, you know, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but when we can't find a better solution to bring down rising costs and there's a budget target to meet, especially in the short term, uh, the easiest way to do it on the federal side is to try to squeeze down prices. So that's what's happened in Medicare. That's what's happened to a greater extent in, uh, in Medicaid, although Medicare is on track to, uh, to catch up uh, under current law. And um, the, the challenge is that that's not the direction of uh, health care. Uh, innovation. So we're headed now for treatments. You see this more in cancer, I think, than anywhere else, where the, the right treatment for a patient we can increasingly uh, personalize. That depends on uh, genomics, proteomics, preferences of the patient. And from a financing standpoint, what that makes you think is that, well, we shouldn't have um, you know, sort of broad prices that are low across the board for everyone, but we should be encouraging high value treatments that are individualized or combinations of treatments that are individualized to particular patients. And what we need to be doing is a better job of supporting each individual patient get the right, getting the right combinations of therapies uh, uh, for their own circumstances. It's sort of the opposite direction of taking kind of the, the blind instrument approach of, of squeezing down prices, kind of the opposite direction to personalized medicine. And so what I mainly want to talk about today is what I call this alternative approach here, which is happening a lot, which you all are discussing a lot during this conference, of reforming care through aligned financing, finding ways to both simultaneously uh, reduce overall costs where possible and improve outcomes, and more importantly, to align uh, the, the incentives for developing and applying uh, uh, new treatments and for reforming existing care in a way that uh, what uh, uh, oncologists think really matters for patient outcomes is what we pay for, uh, and that's not what we're doing today. And I think, and again, oncology is probably uh, a more uh, extreme and more opportune case of this than just about anything else uh, in healthcare. Uh, so in terms of opportunities for real health care reform, this is what I mean. In terms of prevention, uh, as you know, we don't do a great job, even where preventive services are free, uh, as they are now in Medicare. Uh, a substantial minority of patients, 30, 40 percent by some estimates, don't use uh, cancer uh, preventive tests for which uh, the evidence base suggests uh, they would be very helpful. Uh, we're moving towards hopefully finding better ways to diagnose uh, and target combinations of treatments in patients. Uh, still a lot of work to do to figure out the, the, the right combination of diagnostics and how to apply them, and some real questions about how that uh, diagnostic information is actually impacting uh, uh, medical practice. Uh, when patients do need intensive therapy, say for their uh, uh, initial treatment or definitive treatment for cancer, the surgeries, the, uh, uh, the, the chemo regimens and the like, uh, we're often uh, not doing that uh, so efficiently. Uh, there, there are lots of examples of, uh, you know, as you've heard on the, the news recently, a lot of attention around readmissions and preventable complications from surgical procedures. Uh, also uh, uh, questions around whether the most uh, uh, effective uh, evidence-based chemotherapy uh, regimens or other treatment regimens are being used uh, in particular patients. In patients with more advanced illness where uh, care coordination between the oncologist, the surgeon, uh, and maybe an entire uh, care team uh, become more important. There are lots of examples of 
uh, of problems uh, of, uh, of information uh, uh, falling through the gaps uh, or patients having uh, potentially preventable admissions to uh, the emergency room, to the hospital for conditions like uh, dehydration, pain, uh, other complications of treatment that could, at least in principle, be avoided. And most importantly, and I come back to this theme, uh, uh, you all know that uh, uh, care is headed uh, towards a more personalized direction based on uh, the individual characteristics of a patient uh, where, you know, whether, where, where the question isn't, uh, you know, is this uh, uh, chemotherapy regimen or this combination of treatments um, uh, really valuable overall or not valuable overall, but what does it matter for, for, for this, for a particular patient where the, the benefits uh, and the risks uh, of treatment uh, should be much more personalized and the value of treatment should be much more personalized. And um, I think you've heard, and I know from some of the people that you're hearing from in this conference, you will hear uh, and probably have some experiences from your own practice of where uh, getting this kind of support uh, can be difficult, where uh, as uh, payment rates keeps getting squeezed down across the board, it's increasingly uh, imperative for oncologists to uh, do a couple of things to uh, help make ends meet in their practice that, that may not directly focus on the best, uh, 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 on what's best for individual patients. Uh, for example, uh, with a lot of chemo, uh, with a lot of practice revenues driven by the, uh, the, the margin on, uh, on chemotherapy administration or the margin on providing uh, uh, low uh, uh, marginal cost tests, uh, there's been a, a, a definitely a, a trend towards more use of those services, not because it's necessarily the most important thing for patients, but because uh, that's, what, uh, that's what's needed to, to make ends meet. Uh, there's been a uh, uh, similarly uh, difficulty for oncologists to do things like, and I've seen this in practices around the country, where the uh, the oncologists want to uh, keep uh, a, uh, a member of their staff available evenings and weekends, maybe provide some uh, acute care alternatives to going to the emergency room or getting them into the hospital. Uh, but those kinds of phone consultations or email consultations or relying on a nurse practitioner may not be reimbursed at all. Uh, in fact, if you kind of go down the list of uh, care coordination services, uh, personalized services that may make a difference to individual patients, uh, diagnostic tests that could be highly valuable and in influencing treatment course for a patient, often those are poorly reimbursed or not reimbursed at all. So there is a, uh, a misalignment between what matters most for patients uh, with cancer or patients at risk for developing cancer uh, and the way that we pay uh, for cancer care that, that has always been an issue, but is increasingly an issue as we have an increasingly broad array of treatment options available and as much of cancer care should be moving towards uh, earlier uh, interventions towards the use of services, information systems, uh, uh, smartphones, uh, other technologies that are not part of traditional health care and are not reimbursed uh, under traditional payment systems. And um, I think one of the, the big themes that uh, in the work that we've done, and I'll talk about some of this, and the work that I know many other organizations, private payers, uh, Medicare through pilots and the like are trying to do, uh, is, to, is to address that mismatch. Uh, find reforms uh, in health care delivery that are needed, uh, where the evidence suggests, uh, strongly suggests that patients can do better uh, in getting uh, uh, innovative care, innovative ways of delivering care, match them to changes in payment uh, that uh, give the actuaries and the economists involved some confidence that these steps can take place while still addressing those very high pressures of rising health care costs. And what I hope was apparent from that slide earlier uh, was that, you know, if you think it's been a tough reimbursement environment up to now, just wait a year or two. Uh, just wait. It's, it's, it's going to get uh, uh, much, much tighter. So that's, uh, that, that, uh, that's great. But, but that's the opportunity for leadership here. So uh, I think what, uh, the, 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 what's the unavoidable conclusion is that we can't keep doing things the way that we've been doing. It's not financially sustain sustainable. Just trying to do another round of Medicare or Medicaid price squeezes or restrictions on access to innovative approaches innovative approaches to diagnosis or innovative uh, management strategies is not going to work. Uh, where the leadership is really needed is providing some more confidence that the better approaches can be matched to reforms and payment that aren't just the traditional fee-for-service, you know, pay for more volume and intensity and squeeze down the prices. Uh, that th These approaches can work to get to better care and a more sustainable uh, fiscal path. And I think there's some reasons to be optimistic, optimistic about that. Um, so I want to talk about four uh, main uh, policy directions that are, I, I think are critical 
and that I hope you'll think about as uh, you continue your work. And, and, and you know, as you'll see, this is already, uh, these are all already part of uh, a lot of the reform efforts that are underway. Uh, first of all, you got to start with data measurement and evidence. If you can't measure it, you can't, uh, can't do very much to support it. Uh, we do a really good job of measuring the, the volume and intensity of chemotherapy, of radiation therapy and the like. We don't do a very good job of measuring uh, some things that matter to uh, oncology patients. Uh, thanks to the work of ASCO and um, uh, the NCCN and others, uh, we have more evidence-based guidelines out there, and uh, those are starting to be used as a basis for payment and redirecting resources. I think those kinds of process-oriented uh, uh, measurements are very important. Uh, did a patient get uh, the latest evidence-based treatment uh, for their condition uh, or not. Uh, I do think there needs to be more work around outcomes-oriented uh, uh, measurement, uh, uh, measuring complications such as uh, we did in the, the 2006 uh, uh, oncology demonstration program at, uh, uh, in Medicare and uh, such as being included in some of the uh, pilots and some of the accountable care organizations that are implementing payment reforms and delivery reforms in cancer care. Now, uh, there also are some opportunities to build this this into uh, healthcare information systems more routinely. A lot of times oncologists and other practitioners rightly feel like uh, there's, you know, uh, people are uh, sort of checking up on their work after the fact and some of these performance measures come from sources that uh, either are not transparent or uh, uh, don't seem valid. Uh, a way to avoid that is to have the data being used for these performance tracking approaches and, and uh, evidence development approaches come right out of the data that's being used uh, in medical practice. And there are a number of examples of this happening around the country now, and I think we're going to talk about some of them during this conference. Uh, with better measures, um, it's possible to uh, change the way that we pay and change the way that benefits are designed and try to get a better alignment between the care that oncologists want to provide and what we're actually, how, how our financing systems are actually supporting uh, our health care uh, system. Um, so uh, here I want to talk a little bit broadly about um, reforming payments based on value and this notion of accountable care uh, that I've been working on a lot since we left government. Um, some of you may know I um, co-chair along with Elliot Fisher from Dartmouth, uh, uh, an ACO learning network, Accountable Care Organization learning network. And there's been a lot of focus recently on ACOs and I'll talk about how they're growing rapidly and so forth. But the main point of this isn't any particular acronym and isn't uh, ACOs per se. It's this notion of incremental feasible steps that add up to fundamental changes in the way the healthcare financing works. So it's moving away from volume and intensity, the things that we've traditionally been able to measure well and therefore use as a basis of reimbursement, and instead pay for what really matters to uh, patients. And what really matters to patients, especially in areas like oncologists, is in large part, uh, or in good part, uh, not entirely, but in good part, what matters to their uh, providers. So there, there's an opportunity for real alignment here between uh, uh, providers, patients, and payers, uh, but it does mean starting somewhere. It means starting now, given the urgency of the financial pressures that I just described. Um, I first heard about uh, these notions, and um, when I was at um, CMS, before any of these acronyms had come along, one of my early meetings there, and I started at CMS in 2004 after the Medicare reform law passed, and it was one of my priorities there was to implement that. Uh, but one of my early meetings was with the CEOs for some uh, some uh, 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 multi-specialty group practices who came in and gave me this laundry list of things that they were trying to do for their patients, like use preventive services for cancer screening more effectively, uh, manage chronic illnesses more effectively by setting up uh, patient care teams using nurse practitioners and other allied health professionals for more targeted interventions, including uh, visits at home and the like, uh, taking steps to set up care teams for patients who did need high acuity care in the hospital and the post-acute care uh, to minimize the, uh, the fumbling of information with transitions between sites and to have a, a sort of well-established protocols in place to, to, to minimize complications, uh, to use uh, 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 steps to co communicate and coordinate with other providers, uh, and so on. And they pointed out that, look, all these steps, and they had numbers showing that these were improving care for their patients uh, and actually helping lower overall Medicare costs, but the problem was they weren't getting paid for any of them, not any of them. So uh, they were getting whacked really 
twice. One was making all these investments in care that they thought really mattered to their patients and not getting paid for. And the second was to the, to the extent that the stuff actually worked and patients had fewer emergency room visits and fewer hospitalizations, they lost that reimbursement too because that's what Medicare did pay for. So we set up this notion to try to get incrementally, you can't stop the healthcare system and, and, and fundamentally transform it on a dime uh, the right way, I wish we could, but there are a lot of people who are understandably uh, uh, nervous about, you know, for something as big and complex and it matters so much to people's lives about uh, uh, radical change. So we try to come up with a, a feasible way to start down a different path. And that was this notion of shared savings. And the idea was they still, the, the, payer, the, the provider still get, kept getting paid with their traditional Medicare payments, their Part B payments, and, and for the systems, the hospital care, and so forth. But the deal was that if we agreed on a set of performance measures that we thought were important for the patients and also uh, were important for uh, Medicare in terms of uh, achieving uh, uh, more efficient care. And the deal was that if they showed improvement in most of these measures of quality, and if we saw an overall reduction in cost trends, they could keep most of the savings above a threshold. There's a threshold of 2% uh, because our actuaries told us we needed that much to make sure that this wasn't happening by chance, that it really was a, uh, a difference in trend and so forth. Uh, but beyond that, they could keep 75% of the additional savings. And so that started out with a program before anything was ever called an ACO, called a Physician Group Practice Demonstration, involved 10 multi-specialty groups, about 30 measures, including some related to cancer screening for the overall population and some related to chronic disease management. And those have expanded into uh, measures of, of uh, chronic disease management, including some common uh, uh, cancer uh, patient experience measures and uh, um, evidence-based process of care measures uh, since then. Uh, all of those organizations are participating. Uh, and they've all, uh, this has moved on into uh, a, a, a big acceleration in the use uh, of ACOs around the country in both the public and private sectors. I would say that while, um, as you can see from this chart, they're both, um, uh, there's a list of sort of public sector and, and uh, private sector ACOs. I'm not going to spend um, any time on the, the, the details here except to say that we're now up to uh, more than 250 of these. And while the public ACOs, uh, I think, are understandably getting a lot of attention. So Medicare now has, under the ACA, uh, uh, not a pilot program, but an intrinsic part of Medicare that's a shared savings ACO, as I just described. Uh, that's now up to 116 ACOs. Uh, the next um, application, debt, and that's about 2.5 million, um, uh, close to 2.5 million um, Medicare beneficiaries. The next deadline for expanding that program is January 1st, and there's something like 500 uh, applicants, uh, uh, program applicants this time around, so that's going to probably, they're not all going to get in, but uh, a lot are, and that's going to probably double the number of Medicare beneficiaries in these uh, arrangements. And then CMS has also set up a, 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 a glide path towards moving towards uh, more uh, fundamental changes in payments. So, you know, think of it as, um, you know, two tracks and, you know, the train of healthcare delivery is sort of barreling down the tracks. You can't stop, uh, stop that uh, or, and you don't want it to go off the tracks. You don't want to do anything that's really going to impede uh, uh, effective patient care, but you do want to get on a different track. So uh, shared savings is kind of building a second track that's got uh, a set of performance measures which initially are not going to be great but can get better over time as data systems and, and information exchange and all the kinds of things that these improvements in care delivery that aren't paid for now uh, could potentially support as that happens. And then over time, more of the, the weight of reimbursement is going to shift. And that's what's happening in Medicare. Medicare has some more advanced uh, ACOs, they're calling pioneers, uh, that are on track, at least have promised, to switch at least half of their reimbursement to that new track, the new performance-based track by three years from now. If you look at what's going on in the private sector, this is where I think the private sector is a bit more advanced uh, in um, uh, in this chart, uh, that, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, stars in, um, well, really all over. I think uh, something like 40 plus states now, uh, but especially out in California, Massachusetts, uh, the Boston area, and some other uh, parts of the country, um, most of the private ACO implementation is going way beyond shared savings. So take like, say, 20, 30 percent out of the traditional fee-for-service reimbursements. Maybe it's for, uh, uh, you know, primary care uh, fee-for-service services. Maybe it's for things like chemo administration. Put it into uh, a performance-based payment. That gives the providers involved more flexibility in how they deliver care because it's not tied uh, as much as it is on an, under a shared savings model to the 
traditional ways of delivering care. This is, uh, uh, this is a new challenge for providers, and the reason you want to go gradually is because they are taking on a new kind of financial risk. I like to remind people that providers take on all kinds of financial risk today under a fee-for-service system with that laundry list of things I was just describing that don't get reimbursed much or don't get reimbursed at all uh, under a traditional fee-for-service system. So, you know, it's really a matter of sort of picking your, uh, picking your risk, and that makes it a matter of uh, understanding uh, uh, the financial implications of one or another type of contract. As organizations have gotten more comfortable with the ACO-type contracts and being uh, evaluated and paid in part based on performance, not just volume and intensity, they've gotten more comfortable with moving into contracts that give them more resources uh, in order to change the way that, uh, that care is delivered. So now that's ACOs. Um, what I want to emphasize uh, again, though, is that it's not about uh, an ACO payment, an overall payment to an organization. I know there's some debates about, um, you know, are ACOs going to be, you know, these sort of big uh, HMO type fully integrated systems. I don't think that's the case. If you look at the ones that have formed now, about half are um, our system base, about half are led by physicians or uh, are more um, uh, uh, independent um, uh, coordinated care efforts short of uh, uh, integrated ownership. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more of that. Uh, and some of the things on this list uh, illustrate uh, how. Uh, so medical homes, um, you know, a lot of people view and, and, you know, I think to some extent uh, the CMS, CMMI program has been set up this way as well. You know, we're going to try out medical homes, we're going to try out bundle payments, we're going to try out ACOs. We're going to try out all these things. We're going to try to get evidence over the next three or five years and see what works. If you look at the chart that I showed you before about the trends in healthcare costs, we don't have five years uh, to, to wait and see what works and do something about uh, bending the cost curve uh, if we want to have resources available to do anything to improve, anything significant to improve patient care. So we need something sooner. And what a lot of the private payers are doing, especially, is combining these efforts. So uh, many of the ACOs that we've worked with in the private sector started out as medical home initiatives where they were paying their uh, primary care providers more uh, for delivering uh, uh, what their patients really wanted, you know, more coordinated care, better management of chronic diseases. It wasn't working under traditional primary care reimbursement. Uh, but they've linked it to ACO-type payments, where the, the primary care physicians, in many cases, are taking on some accountability, uh, not just for whether they have a, a you know, a, a, a level three uh, medical home in terms of uh, technical capabilities, but whether they are actually lowering uh, uh, com complication rates and lowering cost trends uh, for their patient population. Again, it's, it's a it's a new kind of risk to take on. It's one that takes some time and effort to, to, to build into, but it is happening. And uh, also, it's a recognition that you can't get overall costs down, especially for conditions like cancer, where the care is predominantly involving specialists, uh, without active involvements and in specialists in the process. So some of these organizations are, are linking things like medical homes to some episode-based payments. Uh, some of the interesting things that look like are on your uh, on your list for the, the conference today, some of the, the work that um, uh, places like United Health are doing where they're taking that, uh, uh, that uh, payment for chemo administration to and turning into a bundle on a, on a per patient basis that's not tied, again, to the volume and intensity of chemo, but tied to things like, does the patient have a plan of care in place, uh, is latest kind of evidence-based treatment being used, uh, and the like. Um, so these are, these are ways to, to change the way that, that resources flow to get better results uh, at a lower cost. I did want to mention one thing just because it's, I think it's going to be increasingly important for um, uh, oncology is accountable payments applied to drugs and devices. Um, so again, the accountability that I've been talking about so far uh, is a, a move away from volume and intensity in financing for providers. Uh, but the same thing, same thing is going for uh, manufacturers too. This is especially becoming common outside the U.S., but there are examples here. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was a United uh, effort a few years ago with Oncotype DX. As you all know, this was uh, um, profiling, um, a, a diagnostic profiling technology it was supposed to identify patients who are at higher uh, or lower uh, likelihood of responding to certain uh, breast cancer treatments based on Herceptin status uh, and the like. Uh, and the idea in reimbursement is, uh, does that actually have an impact on patient care. So instead of just paying a certain amount for the diagnostic test, if it really does help the right patient get the right treatment and, they, and get to higher value in care delivery, maybe avoid some 
uh, un, uh, unnecessary low benefit uh, and costly uh, uh, chemo and complications, uh, that diagnostic test should be worth a lot more uh, than, uh, uh, than what a traditional fee-for-service payment system uh, uh, would pay for it. Uh, but uh, you need some, some real evidence in practice that it's, that it's having that kind of impact. Uh, similarly, for uh, some of the new um, uh, costly uh, biologics, uh, beta serine is a, uh, is a uh, very promising treatment for some patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are not responding to other uh, treatments in this uh, uh, new uh, payment arrangement between Health Alliance Medical Plans and Bayer. Uh, the rebate for using beta serine is tied to how often patients who are on it have complications requiring hospitalization uh, for their rheumatoid arthritis. So it's a way of um, shifting some of this um, uh, move towards accountability for results to the, the, the manufacturers of the products involved as well. Uh, there are lots of examples of evidence development uh, uh, being tied to, uh, to this too, uh, often in, in practice uh, as uh, uh, the new drugs and combinations of treatments get used. Uh, there, there are opportunities to learn more about uh, which types of patients are really responding the most, and you can see how that might reinforce uh, a uh, payment system that has uh, uh, part of the payment tied to collection of information on results and complications for patients. Uh, and uh, uh, towards uh, using that evidence to improve our, our evidence base. So really, instead of a bunch of different kinds of reforms, medical homes, bundled payments, ACOs, and, uh, and uh, new payments for drugs, uh, this really is a, an effort to align uh, the different pieces of our uh, uh, provider payment models in a way that reinforces a common goal, common set of uh, uh, goals for patients. And that's why I think the, the emphasis should, should be on not viewing these as competing alternatives, but viewing these as all pieces of, of incremental, incrementally but fundamentally changing the way that we pay for care to make it much better aligned with paying for value in individual patients. And we can do this through common performance measures, especially measures that are increasingly oriented towards outcomes like prevention of complications, patient experience, uh, where we've got some good, uh, good, good uh, uh, knowledge base in oncology, need to build on it, but a good, good knowledge base, uh, where we need um, to support better data sharing to underlie uh, the exchange of information to improve performance among the primary care providers, and especially the oncologists who are you know, increasingly going to be viewed as the, the medical home for uh, patients uh, with, uh, uh, with cancer, and uh, evaluation methods tied to the data that are, that are produced through these efforts. So um, that, that's the overall goal on, uh, uh, on payment uh, reform. There are some additional, I think, specific implications for Medicare physician payment. I want to give a special thanks to ASCO uh, and COA and some of the other oncology groups around the country. They're trying to translate this to a better approach for dealing with the uh, Medicare SGR than what we've seen in the past. And again, the, the basic idea is to identify some ways that oncologists are being paid now that, doesn't really, that don't really contribute as much as they could to value, and instead move those payments into a way that is more uh, value tied. And, in, and this helps us get out of the sort of the traditional way of looking at physician payment. This is a little uh, uh, slice of the pie, it's 15 percent of overall uh, Medicare spending, uh, even though the decisions in that physician payment slice influence 80% or more of Medicare spending. So if there are things that, uh, that, that can be supported uh, through physician payment reform that impact overall cost of care, uh, like that uh, lead to more effective and efficient use of, of chemotherapy, like that lead to some prevention of hospitalizations with complications, like that lead to uh, switching the side of care to uh, uh, a, a, a ambulatory setting or an outpatient office rather than an inpatient setting. All of those things have system-wide health care costs and our current payment systems for physicians don't get reflected at all uh, in the SGR calculation uh, by shifting the way that uh, oncologists are paid so that some of the payment uh, is not just to volume and intensity of their services, but to things that oncologists are doing that can impact these overall costs. It's a way to make not only physician payment better, uh, but to support uh, reforms in care that, uh, that get to this more personalized, prevention-oriented approach to uh, on oncology care. Um, I just want to wrap up with a, a couple of comments about um, uh, the benefit side of, of financing reform. So what's gotten a lot of attention is the kind of thing that, that I've been talking about now, which is uh, changes in payments to providers. Um, looking ahead, uh, my sense is that an even more powerful 
uh, force for driving changes in care delivery towards uh, uh, potentially towards uh, greater efficiency and more innovation uh, is in changes that affect um, uh, financing on the patient side or the, the benefit side. Uh, I was going to give you an example of this from um, Medicare Part D, that, that, you know, the, the drug program that uh, uh, we implemented while I was at CMS. This was done in a different way from traditional Medicare, so there wasn't um, one single benefit um, structure defined and one single benefit pa package with you know, certain treatments on and off a, 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 a overall uh, national formulary or something like that. Um, it was a, a drug benefit where the standard was set up to be uh, deductible, then 25% coinsurance, then catastrophic coverage on the back end with that famous donut hole in the middle because people thought the cost of this were going to be much higher than it turned out to be. Um, but there were going to be competing private plans delivering the benefit. Um, you all know how today, how many beneficiaries are in that traditional, or that, that benefit design that was outlined in the statute? Almost none, something like 5%. Uh, the vast majority of beneficiaries have chosen plans that have a tiered structure, which is now you know, the, the norm in, uh, uh, in care delivery. And the tiered structure has much more of, uh, it's definitely not perfect, um, but it has much more of a um, cost-effectiveness uh, uh, flavor to it, where the really cost-effective drugs, the generics, when they're available, uh, are like a dollar. They're basically free. Uh, and then in areas where they're common uh, uh, brand name drugs available on an outpatient basis, those might cost, uh, you know, 30 bucks uh, a month. Uh, and then most everything else uh, in the first five years of the program has been covered, but beneficiaries pay a larger share of the cost difference. Um, so instead of under a traditional benefit design, if you decide to switch from a brand name drug to a generic drug, you might save you know, 20 bucks, whatever 20% of the, the overall cost difference is. Under this approach, you would save more like 80 or $90. And if you switch from a non-preferred to a preferred brand name drug with its, you know, that meets uh, some of the evidence-based criteria, you would save uh, not, again, not, you know, $15, but something more like $60 or $70. And that's exactly what beneficiaries did. So there are an awful lot of complaints about this program. I know I went around the country and talked to seniors about it. Uh, the complaints were, were mostly around uh, why is this thing so damn confusing? Why are there so many choices? Why can't you just come up with a, a drug benefit and let me enroll in? Why can't you make this simpler? The flip side of that uh, was that people did tend to choose plans that had lower premiums, and the plans that had lower premiums were the ones that had this tiered structure that didn't do the, uh, the traditional insurance design. And with the tiered structure came a huge amount of shifting. And that's where I was expecting a lot more complaints than we got. We set up a whole uh, customer service staff to deal with complaints about switching from brand to generic drugs and, and from non-preferred to preferred brand name drugs. And those never really materialized. Didn't get a complaint rate higher than maybe one per thousand beneficiaries per month. So this was not an easy program to implement by no means, and it certainly has had uh, its frustrations, especially around implementation uh, with seniors. But at this point, uh, the program is, is uh, very popular. The costs are running about 40% uh, lower than projections. That's the difference between the red line at the top and the blue line. There's still a lot of health care costs, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, but they're a lot lower than they would have been uh, according to the projections based on traditional ways uh, of using uh, prescription drugs. And there are other things that contribute to this too, but no question, a big contributor was that, uh, say, use of generics has gone from seniors to about, from about 50% at the beginning of 2006 to close to 80% today. The use of non-preferred to preferred brand name drugs has seen similar rates of increase. Basically, seniors are saying uh, we view brands as equivalent to generics, and we view at least in these major categories like cholesterol-lowering drugs and uh, um, oral uh, hy uh, hypoglycemic agents and things like that. Uh, we view the preferred brands in the vast majority of cases as, as uh, just about as good as the non-preferred brands, and has saved a huge amount of money. Um, this has not yet come to the rest of healthcare. Uh, it's starting to. Um, there are, uh, again, in the private sector, not so much in, uh, in Medicare, uh, at least yet, uh, there are uh, employers that are setting up benefit designs where they provide information on, say, the, uh, the cost of an MRI and hopefully the quality of the, the MRI or other uh, elective uh, uh, tests along with it uh, and give beneficiaries much more of a sort of a fixed amount of uh, money towards the cost of getting that procedure. Same thing's being done for some 
elective procedures like colonoscopies and bypass operations with the idea that uh, uh, coupling uh, both uh, good information about quality and uh, this uh, stronger um, uh, financial incentive will get people who would be, you know, above the deductible limit, would be above the deductible for any, you know, if you're hospitalized for a day, uh, you're going to be above the deductible for even a, a high deductible health plan. Uh, but these approaches get, uh, get those uh, uh, consumers who can potentially be some really powerful sources of support for health care reform. Uh, much more um, into a position where they can benefit financially uh, from making uh, uh, more efficient decisions in cases like bypass surgery. I, I'm looking, for, uh, looking forward to seeing more data, but uh, in the, the places that have implemented this, the, the low-cost places are better. Uh, they're lower cost because they have shorter hospital stays, fewer readmissions, uh, people are back to work faster, uh, and the overall costs are substantially lower. I'm not talking about like $10, $20, I'm talking about like $30,000 lower. And so in these new kinds of benefit designs, the, uh, the uh, insurers can say, uh, you know, basically you know, we'll, we'll give you a free operation, maybe even fly your spouse there if you go to uh, one of our high value providers. And here's the, here are the measures showing that this provider really is one that you can trust. You know, they, they have lower complications. Almost nobody dies. You're back to work faster. The, they're, they're good measures of patient experience and functional status afterwards. You know, those are hard things to do, much harder than like brand versus generic drugs. Uh, but, they're, uh, uh, but they're coming at least in, in some of these areas of care. And uh, if you want to go to your local bypass provider, we can do that, but we're still only paying you know, this overall uh, global amount of $30,000 or whatever it is. So if, uh, uh, if your surgery ends up costing more, you could end up paying $10,000, $20,000 beyond, something that would have never happened under traditional insurance design. Uh, and uh, those kinds of steps, uh, I think, again, we haven't seen these widely yet, but they do seem to be leading some bigger changes in care delivery, just as Part D did. Part D did uh, uh, associated with a big shift, a big rapid shift uh, in the way that uh, that seniors used uh, outpatient prescription drugs. Uh, so, you know, putting that all together, I was going to say something about innovation too, but I think I'm about out of time. Uh, but basically, the, on the innovation side, there, there are ways to uh, uh, support using the same kinds of steps towards better evidence and, and uh, uh, promoting both payments and, and benefit designs that encourage uh, higher value care. Um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to move in the same direction. Uh, putting this all together, uh, again, I think oncology is the, a place where uh, the action is going to be. Uh, there are going to be some modifications uh, in the ACA. Uh, among those modifications are going to be steps that uh, will put more pressure on finding ways to, uh, to, to lower costs while improving uh, quality and innovation. Um, I think that, um, you know, I know there are a lot of concerns among oncologists and other physicians that, you know, if we keep on the road that we're on, just keep cutting the payment rates, there are going to be huge access problems for Medicare beneficiaries. We're not going to get to innovative care. I actually think one of the bigger risks is not so much that. If you look at that chart that I showed you before, what Americans have consistently shown over the last 30 years, given a choice between spending more on health care and spending more on everything else, they're going to take health care. Um, what really happens is that we end up with very few resources available for education, uh, for supporting the low-income, uh, less advantaged uh, uh, individuals and families in this country, and all of that ends up, <laughs> that's what really leads to higher health care costs and more uh, uh, health and well-being problems uh, uh, down the road. Uh, but uh, we are also at this really critical point in terms of where innovation is headed, and, and we're now at a point where I, is that these, you know, these broad fee-for-service prices just don't work. Care is getting more prevention-oriented and personalized. Cancer is leading the way on that, and that's a good thing. Uh, so in order to facilitate that, uh, we really do need to align the payment systems, and that's what gives me some ultimate optimism here, is there's too much at stake. Uh, if you look at what's coming in cancer innovation, uh, in terms of the potential to uh, uh, identify uh, subgroups of patients that really are going to respond to treatments, maybe even respond to, to treatments before they ever develop the cancer, uh, that's, that is too valuable, uh, too valuable an opportunity for this country and the world to pass up. So I can't tell you exactly how we're going to get there, uh, but I am pretty optimistic that uh, one way or another, with your leadership, we're going to find a way uh, to solve these problems, to get to more affordable and innovative care, and I uh, hope cancer can lead the way. Thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you. I think we'll take a few questions. Uh, uh, Mark, do you want to sit there? Any questions for Dr. McClellan? Not Otis today either, but then. <laughs> Hi, I'm Merrill Guzner. I'm a, Merrill. Uh, I'm a 
senior correspondent for the Fiscal Times and uh, do uh, regular contribute to the National Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Uh, Mark, you've outlined, of course, all the reform, all the experiments that are in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're a couple of weeks away from an election where we don't know what's going to happen to the Affordable Act in the new year. How much of these are permanent and embedded in the system now? How much are at risk? Um, I think the, the payment reforms are, are certainly embedded. If you look at, you know, like I showed you on that chart, a majority of the ACOs, for example, are being implemented in private plans that are um, not going to be directly affected by uh, anything that happens with the election. Um, I do also think that, um, you know, going back to my chart even earlier than that, that chart about uh, increased spending projections in, in Medicare, even with some very tight uh, 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 price uh, controls in physician payment and, and some other aspects of Medicare payment, uh, those pressures aren't going away. And you're seeing more and more, you know, I think one of the reasons, uh, I think uh, we're seeing a lot more physician leadership, or at least I'm seeing a lot more physician leadership, including uh, oncology practice, and saying, you know, we just don't want to be paid the same way anymore. Uh, and that's because of two things. One is because you know, the, the, the payment systems are increasingly poor fit with the care they want to deliver. And the other is that the physicians are sick and tired of the, uh, the tighter and tighter price regulation or restrictions on, uh, uh, on, on, what the, on how they get paid under traditional reimbursement mechanisms. And those aren't, those aren't going away either. Um, there have been, uh, uh, in the past, a lot of um, Republican supporters for ACOs and uh, bundled payments and some of these other kinds of reforms. Uh, so I, I don't really see that see that uh, see that changing uh, either way whoever wins they're facing a, a really urgent set of problems around the, the costs uh, and uh, uh, and quality of care and that's going to be a f uh, you know, forefront issue in next year's debate about how do we deal with the deficit uh, reform taxes avoid a, a second uh, or a follow-on recession uh, and and so forth uh, all of which are you know real possibilities if uh, if nothing else happens but a repeal uh, two questions, two related Easy. questions, Mark. One is, um, there. I agree with you, there's just this ton of activity. And one of the things I worry about is that it's not all going in the same direction. And so doctors and cancer centers can get, yeah. you know, conflicting, uh, yes, we're going to do bundles here and we're going to do a different kind of uh, structured ACO here and different yeah. patient incentive. And how do you see that playing out? Uh, is there going to be more federal, state, private coordination or not? And the second thing is, mm -hmm. Um, at least my experience, and I'd like you to reflect on your experience, but also your knowledge. Now, there had been some resistance in CMS to payment change, um, and uh, I at least detect now that they're at least more open. Uh, whether we'll, you know, get that train going faster, I was just wondering if you could uh, look into your crystal ball and uh, say something about uh, how you see that evolving. Uh, um. Yeah, I don't think people should worry too much that there are a lot of different payment approaches being tried. And I think one of the important questions for a group like this one, and, and you know, frankly, oncologists more generally, is, is what can they feasibly do to you know, get more momentum in, in the right direction? Um, one thing I would suggest, as I put on one of those slides to breeze through, is a, a real emphasis on identifying and supporting implementation of some common measures for, for the important things that aren't being supported now uh, that that should be a, a focus of reform. So examples of this might be, uh, you know, some of the continued work that, that NCCN and other groups are doing around evidence-based um, uh, uh, practice uh, 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 guidelines. Um, those are being used in some of the, the, the at least the private sector payment reforms uh, now. Um, more work around uh, um, risk-adjusted outcome measures, so measures of patient experience, measures of uh, preventable complications. There have been uh, a number of examples of, of using these as well and risk-adjusted uh, uh, costs of care. Um, with more consistent measures, that means that practices that, that do have to deal with Medicare, Medicaid, you know, nine different private payers uh, have uh, more of a, a sort of common hook to hang their hats on when they're trying to uh, reform care. 
and also a better way to consistently evaluate whether some of these reforms uh, are having an impact. And as I, as I said earlier, you know, I, I actually don't view it as a problem that we're doing, you know, bundled payments and medical homes and hopefully oncology homes and, and ACOs at the same time. They all ought to be reinforcing. And one of the things that I'm actually concerned about with, you know, sort of the, the pilot approach, as, as Meryl was talking about, you know, the test approach is that it kind of discourages, uh, in some ways, doing all these together. This is kind of traditional notion that, well, if we're going to figure out if something works, we've got to, like, do this, you know, this is, this is where we come from with uh, experimental, you know, design and clinical trial training. So we want to vary this one thing and hold everything else constant and do the long-term follow-up over three to five years. That's just not going to happen. I mean, there's, there's too much pressure for change and uh, too many reasons for, for more rapid change with something like our, our healthcare system. So uh, having some common measures and seeing what, you know, having evaluation methods that focus more on whether these, these reforms collectively uh, are adding up to impacts for patients is, I think, a much better uh, evaluation approach. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, it's you know, kind of time to move past um, uh, testing and pilots alone in the, uh, in the Medicare program. Um, the, you know, I think there's, it's not a coincidence that there now are, you know, upwards of 130 ACOs delivering care around the country, and a number that's probably going to double next year, and, you know, we're still not clear on, you know, where the, you know, the, the bundled payment pilots, for example, haven't been implemented yet by CMMI, and those could be potentially important for oncology. Um, those are in an evaluation program. The ACOs are, are, are uh, founded off of a, a, an integral part of traditional Medicare. Um, and I'd add, uh, this is for extra drama here, you know, we've got the, <laughs> the lights going down. Um, there, there have to be more steps on the, the benefit side, too. It is not enough just to reform payments and uh, a, a sort of vote of uh, uh, clear sympathy with some of the Republican proposals. You, you may not like some versions of premium support, but <laughs> there are versions of those that uh, many Democrats, including President Clinton, have supported in the past, uh, and that Zeke have supported, has supported in the past, uh, that really do give uh, much more of a, uh, uh, create much more pressure from the consumer side, the patient side, uh, for them to be able to, to shift the resources to the kinds of payment systems they want, the kinds of care that they want, and uh, uh, that will help all of this along as well. So uh, don't don't underplay the the, the benefit reform side uh, and the consumer side for for making all this happen faster. Hi, John. Hi, Mark. Th Hi, John Mendelson, MD Anderson. Hi, Mark. Thanks for that talk. Uh, a lot of the things you brought up depend on measures which require an information system that's interoperable with a dictionary and us collecting data in a standardized way. Yeah. And I know that $20 billion was put into uh, electronic health care records in, the, in, in that act a few years ago. Can you give us a progress report on how quickly the information systems are going to be available to do what you want to do? Yeah, I think the, um, the, the sort of the meaningful use payments that you're referring to, they're now moving to stage two, and you know, in the coming year, um, you know, what I hear from all the vendors is that, oh yeah, we're going to have actual data flowing between our electronic record systems and, and others. I mean, that has not happened got very well. Got my fingers well. crossed. Yeah, <laughs> it has not happened very well in the systems up to now. Um, what, I, what I would emphasize, though, is that a lot of the reforms that I've just been talking about have been taking place in the absence uh, of that kind of full information exchange. I remember one of the um, ACOs that we started working with back in 2007, you know, they were trying to do their best to, to keep up with meaningful use and, and you know, these costs and being fully HR systems, but, you know, they looked at the situation on the ground and saw that they weren't going to be able to get the key information they needed to improve performance in the short term, at least on the measures that, uh, that, that were part of the ACO program uh, that they were doing with uh, the private payers at the time. So they actually had a, a nurse um, drive her Jeep between sites and, and set up a manual registry of all their patients with diabetes. And it's, you know, it's not high tech, but uh, it gave them a much better, it gave all the doctors involved in their care, a much better understanding of who their patients with diabetes were. So, you know, that's the kind of problem that we're dealing with now. It's not, you don't need the full interoperable, you know, standardized records. You know, which patients do we need to be treating and, and thinking about? Which ones are we responsible for and aren't getting these treatments somewhere else? And 
are they getting at least the, the basic evidence-based uh, uh, treatments? You don't need a full electronic record for, for a lot of that. And so uh, some of the, the, the work that's sprung up as kind of an intermediate step involving you know, sort of more timely and efficient use of, of claims data so you at least know, you know when your patients are, are having a complication and you can learn something about which ones are at high risk uh, that you want to maybe intervene with earlier, uh, maybe augmented with some additional limited claims information from electronic lab reports that you can get. Uh, and put into a uh, electronic registry. That's where a lot of the uh, the ACOs and the, the bundled efforts are are now. They don't have fully interoperable records, but they still have enough information uh, to make a difference in patients. And the only reason they've got any support for that at all is, you know, not because of meaningful use standards coming next year, but because they're getting shared savings or they're moving towards a partial capitation version of, uh, of payment reform. So it'd be, nice to, it'd be nice if everything were fully interoperable and all that. I don't think we can afford to, to wait till that happens. The good news is that, you know, these measures are definitely not perfect. They have, uh, ad, they can have adverse uh, effects if they're done wrong. I didn't talk as much as I should have about the need to address adverse selection and some of these issues, but um, that, that's no reason, given the, the, the opportunities we have and the urgency of the problems, that's no reason we shouldn't be pushing ahead with at least steps in this, uh, in this direction. This Don't wait for full incremental approach. Yeah, yeah, incremental that adds up to fundamental change. Okay, so we'll have one last question. Hi, I'm Steve Taplin from the uh, Chief of the Process of Care Research Branch at the National Cancer Institute. And I was, uh, the uh, Affordable Care or, uh, organizations offer an incentive for individuals to do particular things right. But a lot of about healthcare is about how individuals share responsibility. So it's not, not just that you get screening done and there is a measure of the proportion of people screened that yeah. could be used, but it's about how it's also to be really successful, you have to also get the follow up of that screening done right. And there's really no measure within currently to look at the proportion of people who have complete follow up of an abnormal screening. Yeah. So there's this problem within the measures that they, they come from a, a traditional uh, value based or procedure based mentality. Whereas, in fact, part of the problem is how do you incent, how do you measure the collaboration and the cooperation that's needed to really achieve healthcare? So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about measurement and what you're thinking about measurement for things like the proportion of people followed up after an abnormal screening and, and, and the proportion of people that have it done correctly. Yeah, I think that, that's a really good point. The measures that we have now and the measures that were in sort of these first round ACOs were ones that largely reflected things that both the payers and providers agreed were important and could be measured validly um, and that were also feasible to collect. And so for things like um, screening rates that depend on, you know, primarily on just the demographics of the population and something that's captured in a health insurance claim, you can see how that could get you to a, a, an early measure. Um, this is a good reason why none of the ACOs that we worked with suddenly went to, okay, now we're going to get paid entirely based on, you know, this set of 33 or whatever limited performance measures. They, they went to uh, a shared savings approach where most of their payments are still based on the traditional way of doing business. Um, so what they've tried to do over time is enhance those measures. Uh, they haven't done it. I, I don't know of any applications, maybe somebody here does, of the measures that, that you're talking about into you know, a payment system, which is usually a reflection of both the providers and the payers agree that it can be measured validly and it has an impact on quality and maybe costs. Um, and that's a measurement problem. So, you know, no question, most of the important things that healthcare providers do weren't and still aren't captured by standard available measures. Um, but because so many things that healthcare providers do were not getting reimbursed under the traditional approach and you know, you're being punished uh, under traditional fee-for-service payment approaches. Um, you know, we need to move to something better. I would love to see more efforts around um, whether you know, NCI and some of the people in this room could um, uh, identify ways of capturing measures of uh, uh, appropriate or effective follow-up. Um, I have to say, in the, you know, what I've seen more practically uh, is um, measures related to emergency room use, um, hospital admission with preventable complications for patients who have been diagnosed where um, the traditional payment systems gave no financial support to oncology groups that were doing things like staffing a phone line after hours or having a nurse practitioner uh, be able to intervene early with these high-risk patients and keep them from having to go to the 
emergency room or the hospital and those those approaches which you know, the, the, you know I think Dr. Sprandio may be talking about medical home uh, things like that if you don't pay for it it's awfully hard uh, for the oncology practices that are trying to do the right thing to sustain it and so you know the, the the measures that have been used have this very practical flavor of oncologists on the ground saying gosh you know we're trying to do these things to improve care um, and we're losing money uh, even though we're getting to better care and what looks like overall cost we got to find a, a way to, to to measure that so that we can reform our payment systems to match up with it and that's you know that's where you, you typically get into taking something out of the existing payment system maybe it's the chemo administration fee maybe it's moving some of the other services that are provided into a bundle, maybe it's shared savings around lowering hospitalization rates, tied to something that you can measure that shows you're making progress on that. And it's been very practically motivated uh, uh, measurement improvement, and we need much more systematic effort. Thank you, Mark. Great. Thank you all very much, and good luck. Lunch is outside. You can either eat here, or you can uh, go to the third floor there, the atrium there. And we'll be back here at 1 o'clock.